Hello, and warmest of Septandi greetings to you and yours. Welcome to the series where I present myself analyzing my code. There's something here for everyone. In today's episode, I'm going to look at the code I wrote to control the enemy. That is the thing that you need to shoot in my Moon Patrol game. Let's go! I've wired up my old code that controls the enemy, so we're going to watch that in action, and then we can talk about how I made that work. So as soon as I start, you're going to see the enemy start here on the right side. It's going to slide in here, and then it's going to like jiggle wildly over the car. The enemy doesn't shoot anything, and it is so huge, it's very hard to miss it. Even though it is uh, jiggling wildly, I'm going to try to miss it. I'm going to see if I can miss it. Oh yeah, I was managed to miss it. Actually, that should be the game, not not shooting the enemy. Now I'll, there we go. So everything slows down while we make a blow up. And and there we go, we're back. And, and that's it. That's the enemy. Uh, so let's talk about this marvel of engineering. So starting in this main loop that you've seen a few times already, if we just go to the bottom, uh, that's where the enemy stuff happens. So that's where we call the routine. N1XE. And the N1XE is really just like a, a little wrapper around the real stuff. It decides whether or not to call enemy one. And it will always call enemy one if it's supposed to be blowing up. So I've got this blow up condition variable. If it's true, we're definitely going to call this and it'll take care of continuing to blow it up. Otherwise, we look at that counter condition that I talked about in a previous video. So when it's number two, then we'll go to the enemy one routine as well. Not in this case to blow it up, but just to figure out what to do. Is it sliding out from the right hand side of the screen? Is it jiggling? What is it supposed to be doing? So let's take a look at enemy one. If I wanted to be fancy, I would say that enemy one is controlled with a state machine. But you all saw it work, so you know there's nothing really all that interesting happening. Anyway, 1x kind of controls what state it's in. So it's set to be 255 if it doesn't exist yet. Otherwise, it'll be the x location if it does exist. So we compare against 255, and if it's not 255, it already exists, so we just jump down here. Otherwise, it does not exist, so we make it exist by changing its state to be 248. So that's going to be the x-coordinate of the right-hand side of the screen, and we'll stick that here. And then in either case, we fall through to this, and we start controlling it. There's some code to deal with blowing up. If it's currently blowing up, I'll come back to that later. And then we ask to see if it is in the state after it's fully emerged. So if it's come all the way to the left-hand side of the screen, then it's going to do its jiggle thing. So in the state when the enemy is scrolling onto the screen and going into the left side, that's actually two states in one. The first state is where it scrolls right on to the right side out of nowhere. And then the next state is where it zooms over to the left side which you can see better if I slow things down a bit. So right now you can see it's starting to get in there. So that's really the first half of this phase. Little bit, little bit, bite by bite, which is actually, a, I think that's four pixels at a time. And it happens so fast you keep, don't even really notice it's doing that. And now it's fully on the screen and so now it's in that second half where it just goes to the left. And as I'm slowing it down you can see I guess I screwed something up with the picture because these colors, you know, that should be blue. <laughs> I don't know if I ever realized I screwed that up. I don't know if I slowed it down like this before. But anyway, so now it's like in that second half, and now it's in the final phase where it just like goes left and right randomly. So in the first half of that phase, the main thing that we're trying to do 
is to call this routine scroll right. This is kind of like those move left, move right, move up, move down subroutines that I showed in a previous video. But this, rather than taking its data from the screen to decide what it's going to draw, it takes it from the that sprite area. So if you remember from a previous video, I talked about this thing, the 6000s, where I was storing the bytes for the different sprites. So scroll right will expect the U register to be filled with the address of the object stored bytes. And it's going to use that location to figure out what bytes need to be drawn. So if we take a look at this, it can handle an object that's either like not fully on the screen yet because it's still scrolling in, or it can handle an object that is fully on the screen and just needs to be moving to the left. So here is that call to scroll right that we're doing just to get it onto the screen initially. And once we're part past that first half of the phase and we're ready to just scroll it left, that's when we end up here. The second half of that phase is just scrolling it to the left side. And this variable here, enemy one phase, keeps track of which phase it's in. So once it's been scrolled into the screen, then we're at phase one. So if our phase is bigger than zero, then we're going to go here. That means either we're scrolling it to the left or we're actually jiggling it. Otherwise, this code transitions us from having finished scrolling onto the right side to the just move to the left side, the phase one. So at EN 1020, that's when we check the phase again. So if we're still at phase one, that means we're going to be doing the uh, moving to the left. EN 1LT does that portion. And E1LT will call this to do the move. And then it just has this little home brewed loop to erase the bytes on the right hand side that the enemy moved away from. So we can get background color over the pixels that it moved away from. So E1 set is just another caller to scroll right, scrolling in from the right hand side. So it handles initializing those variables. And at this point, now that the enemy is fully on the screen, sometimes we're gonna use the first version of the enemy and sometimes, depending on this condition variable, we're going to use the second part of the enemy. That's how we can get it to look animated as it's scrolling to the left. And then that goes into the U register if that was different. And after it's moved, we check to see if we hit our target zone yet, if we're on the left side and we can start jiggling. And if so, that's when we transition into enemy one phase equals two. So normally, once we hit enemy one phase two, then we would branch down to 1040. And 1040 handles the random jiggle. Here's some code from another version. I don't know what to do with this, ignore it. The random jiggle calls the ROM random subroutine, which I mentioned in part one. I, I did not, I don't know how I knew about it, but somehow I knew about it, but not enough to know anything about floating point accumulators because I certainly didn't initialize them. I just called this and assumed that in this part of the floating point accumulator, I'll get like something random enough for my needs. My needs were to figure out if an event happens with three-fourths probability. So I compare the result with 191, and if it's 191 or higher, then it wasn't the 75% event, but the 25% probability event that occurred. And when that happens, I'll branch down here and do a bit of a reversal. So if my, my indicator, my phase indicator, tells me I'm supposed to go left, I'm going to go right. Otherwise, if it tells me I'm supposed to go right, I'm gonna go left. Otherwise, I just do whatever my indicator tells me to do. Left means left, right means right. Anyway, uh, the routine to go left, the routine to go right, calls this N1 left, N1 right. And you've already seen N1 left before. So same, same code. Finally, we'll talk about hit detection, knowing when the bullet has hit the enemy. So starting back at main, recall that main calls EN1XE. EN1XE calls enemy1. And enemy1 uses this variable E1 bullco, the blow up condition. And this tells enemy1 if 
the enemy has just been hit where the enemy has been hit a little while ago and is still in the process of blowing up. So how does this get set? There's a subroutine I talked about in a previous episode called stconst. So this is the shooting continuation subroutine. And inside there, it calls enemblow. Although this occurs right after the horizontal bullet comment, this is actually going to check if the vertical bullet has made contact with the enemy. And the way it does it is by calling a more generalized routine called blow check. So it sets up a bunch of variables first and then calls blow check. Blow check assumes these variables have been set up. So these are opposite corners of a rectangle that you're checking to see if the bullet has made contact with. And then these variables are the X and Y coordinates of the bullet you're checking. On exit, it sets this variable Y1 to be 255 if the object has been blown up. This does something gross. Okay. Uh, so let's see if you can predict what grossness is about to happen. First, we're going to check the X coordinates. So we're going to do this check here. We're going to have A and B be the X1 and the X2 of the object. And horizon is going to be the bullet X so that we can do this test. And what do we do? We just branch over there into the subroutine and then we come right back and we do other things. So we don't seem to look at what the result of this was, whether it was inside that range or not. How could this possibly work if we just go right ahead and like do this and, and, and how does it work? Well, we do our comparison and if it didn't work, then we mess with the stack. So we like undo the first return address on the stack so that this one will take, will basically do two returns in one. And then again, we check the second part of the range here. And if that didn't work, we're going to wipe that return address off and go back. So the only way we're actually going to get to this RTS without messing with the stack is if we're in the range. So, by virtue of being here at all, we know that it was in the range. Jeez Louise, man. And then we just do the same thing for the Y coordinates. And if we're still here by the end of all that, we load A with our exit condition 255 that the object was hit. We stick that into our out variable, and then we get out of here. And then the caller will initialize E1 Bilco with 126 to indicate that yes, the enemy has just been hit and we need to start the blow up process. And for more about how that blowing up actually happens, check out the next episode.